please, uh, please take a seat, everybody. We, uh... Okay, okay, colleagues. We will, um, we will get started on the next on the next panel. So please, um, please take a seat and uh, come to order. I need a, I need a uh, <laughs> camel, <laughs> but I don't have have one. But yes, um, welcome back, everyone. I, um, I'm so excited about this panel. We're going to hear about the role of technology and innovation in empowering Indigenous peoples to map and secure customary land. And I pass the floor to Eva Hershaw, our moderator, who's the Data Indicators and Monitoring Lead at the International Land Coalition at IFAD. Over to you, Eva. Please. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope people will come trickling in and, and thank you for joining us. As Julian said, I'm Eva Hershaw. I'm the, the Land Monitoring and Data Lead at the International Land Coalition. We're a membership-based coalition with more than 300 members across 84 countries. Um, and it's my pleasure to be with you here today, especially talking about how innovation and technology are being used by, with, and, and for indigenous peoples as they map and claim and assert their land and territorial rights. We're also going to hear examples of how they're using maps to document sites of cultural significance, improve their own internal planning and decision making, and to send alerts, rapid alerts, when rights have been violated or deforestation has occurred. We have an excellent panel today um, that will bring together concrete and current examples of how indigenous communities are leveraging technology to achieve their goals as they've determined them. But first, a quick reminder of the context with which we're speaking today and the urgency of the situation to which many of them will speak. It's been more than 15 years since the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was adopted. This was the most comprehensive instrument to recognize, promote, and respect the rights of Indigenous peoples. It was a massive achievement of a decades-long people, Indigenous Peoples Movement. And um, yet we see that the situation of Indigenous peoples is often far from what was promised in UNDRIP. Year after year, data confirms that Indigenous people are disproportionately targeted and attacked, subject to processes of criminalization um, and violations of their individual and collective rights. Indigenous people are custodians of more than 25% of the world's land and much of its remaining intact tropical forest. But we know that only around half of the land and territory that they hold or occupied is recognized. Despite research, including from FAO and FILAC, showing that lands and territories managed by indigenous people are better conserved and have higher rates of biodiversity than other protected lands, the rights of indigenous people also often find themselves at odds with state-led protection schemes that can employ a tactic of fortress conservation that often comes at the detriment to these communities. But, but there are reasons to hope this mentality might be shifting. In December 2022, states adopted the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This was a global agreement and roadmap for the protection of the world's biodiversity. The agreement contained some of the strongest language ever seen in a global framework, recognizing the important role and contributions of indigenous people um, as custodians of biodiversity and partners in conservation. These lands and territorial rights, as well as their right to participation, are recognized throughout the framework. The road to implementation, we know, is long um, when these promises are made, but much of the monitoring and mapping that we will be hearing about today is contributing to this body of work. So with support from the UK government as well, FAO is partnering with ILC and also with Landmark, a, a global platform um, that is making the, the rights, uh, the land and territorial rights of indigenous peoples visible, together with information about pressures on this land and land cover contributions to conservation and biodiversity. It's one of the many efforts being undertaken to support the realization of UNDRIP and to provide the enabling conditions for indigenous people to be effective stewards of their lands and territories. 
we're now going to our panelists. So we'll begin with Ramesh Sharma, who doesn't need an introduction, we've seen you on all the screens, the national coordinator of Ekta Parishad, which is one of the biggest people's movements in India with an iconic, uh, iconic status globally. Ramesh has been leading large-scale mobilizations, campaigns, um, and advocacy. And in the past 20 years, he's played an instrumental role in strengthening and expanding Ekta Parishad as one, as the, one of the most important people's struggles for land rights globally. Um, today, he'll speak to you about how technology is being employed to advance the Forest Act, Rights Act in India. And with that, Ramesh, I hand it to you. Yeah, thanks, Akeo. Thanks, Eva. Uh, thanks to all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of my own organization. And I would like to share some of the interesting approach which we have adopted to understand the whole framework of customary land tenure in India. So, uh, uh, before uh, coming into the subject, uh, let me tell you uh, very briefly about the customary land tenure situation in India. I mean, there is law and there is a flaws also. So we need to understand, if we really want to understand the scope of the law, we need to also understand the wrong side of all those customary legislation, which was, uh, I mean, the colonial legislation, which was actually bring uh, during the British era. And these legislation, this set of legislation, what we call colonial uh, land and forest law, is actually altered the socio-economic structure forever. And for us, this is very important to understand because that was the one who actually created the whole legal blockage for the customary land tenure. The Forest Rights Act in that sense is extremely important for us because there was a shift from uh, 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 institution-centric legislation to the community-centric legislation. So the Forest Rights Act is a very robust framework which actually recognizes the pre-existing rights of the indigenous community in India. And this pre-existing rights are extremely important for us to move forward and to understand the larger scope of the customary land tenure. So what are those pre-existing rights in Indian context? Uh, I mean, uh, the first I would, I must say here that rights of indigenous people and other traditional forest dwellers, which is actually recognized under the Forest Rights Act, uh, which actually recognizes the geocultural resources. And for us, the land, forest, and water is not just a resources, but it's a generational resources, which is important for the survival, dignity, and identity. And that's a key factor for us to understand the larger significance. It's, it's important, it's extremely important, because it's actually talk about the 23% of the geographical area which is directly related to nearly 124 million people and 180,000 villages across south to the north part of India. This particular set of pre-existing rights is important because it's a rights over the geocultural territory. And it's important for us to understand if we're really talking about the indigenous people in India, the rights to knowledge and intellectual property and the rights to defend, regrow, preserve, and to manage their land as well as the forest resources. So here, uh, let's come directly to the Forest Rights Act. And uh, I would like to uh, first to give you a very brief understanding about the chronology of the challenges from where the Forest Rights Act, which was actually came after our movement in 2007, uh, where is the turning points? It's, uh, where are the ups and downs? Where are the rights and wrongs which is there in the institutional framework of Forest Rights Act? If you see the left side of map, you can see the people's occupation over the land and a large number of their claims which has been rejected because of many different reasons. If you go to the right, there is a very interesting data from the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, which actually say that nearly 22 million people in Indian context, they are the indigenous people, they are the forest dwellers, they are the fisher folks, the mats, and the pastoral community, they are eligible to get their land back. Uh, if you see the number of cases which has been filed over the last 16 years, only 20%. So that means there's a huge gap in terms of people's awareness, in terms of government's support to encourage the people to file their claim for the customary land tenure. 
If you see the number of people who have been actually given the illegal entitlement, it's hardly 10%. So there is a huge gap of 90%. And why this 90% is a huge gap? Because the proof of position is one of the key factors, is a key determinant to recognize the legal entitlement. So within the purview of this law, uh, the one family or one household has to produce a legal evidence that he or she is actually occupying this land prior to 2005, December 2005. So there are two key important factors here. The one is the bureaucratic inertia for sharing the land records. Uh, because of the very colonial institutional structure, the land department, it's not really willing to share the land document to the people and especially empower them to file their claims or to get their land back. Uh, the second very important factor for us is the low skills of the community to use the technology for measuring the customary land tenure. I mean, when I say the low skills that there is a two interesting gap. The one is the map of the customary land and forest, which is actually issued by the Forest Survey of India. And if you understand, try to understand the people's position over the customary land tenure, you can find really a big gap. And that gap, it's actually is a 90%. So what we did uh, in the, uh, we started the entire exercise in the last August and uh, uh, we decided to take a one district in, in, the, in the state called Chhattisgarh, which is a tribal dominated state, which is known as an indigenous state. And we have taken a one district called Garyaban, where again, you can see the total tribal percentage and the other forest dwellers is close to 65%, which is a real big and significant number to understand the whole dynamics and the space. So we decided to go and to survey the entire, entire, all the villages in one district called Garyaban. There is 700 villages and we have already covered 565 villages. We have already interviewed 77,555 households. So after analyzing that data, we understood that the 65% people have already filed their claim, but only 20% they receive the entitlement. So again, there is a gap. And if you, just to relate the data with my previous slide, that 80% is a huge gap. So these are the cases which, there is a huge amount of cases which has been rejected. So what data speaks to us? If you really understand that the data which is not actually recognized, there are more than 42% claims which are pending over the many years right between the five years to even some cases are like one to two years or even more than the five years. But the claims which has been rejected is a 58%, again, very high number. The second very important factor here, the claims rejected and informed is a 92% and not yet informed is a 8%. So the ultimate thing which is coming out of this whole data is a high rejection and low recognition of the customary land tenure. And this, is, this was the point where we started to think about how to use the technology to resolve all these disputes and to secure the customary land tenure to the people. So this was a very simple technological intervention uh, from our side. And we, dis we, we saw that the whole technological innovation as an enabler, if we really want to secure the land rights or the customary land tenure to the indigenous people uh, in, in Chhattisgarh. So what we did, we just decided to empower the, uh, the community to use the Kobo tool-based survey for their claims and the entitlement. We also decided to go to analyze the data and the two important factors are the duration of pendency and the reason of rejection. And these were the prime important part for us. We decided to measure the land with the GPS and superimpose with the satellite imagery and to file, refile the claim for the recognitions. So this is very, very important in our cases because the refiling claim is a part of the legal framework. And here we decided to go and to train 60 indigenous young boys and girls from the community. They were super efficient. And if you look that on, within a nine months, they have already interviewed 77,000 claims. And now they are ready to take the GPS system, the GPS coordinate superimposed with the satellite map and the refile their claims. So this actually exercise actually given us a lot of a uh, lot of inspiration, a lot of motivation that we are able to resolve all those high number of rejected cases which was there uh, uh, in, in the Garyaban district. 
So here, the FRA claims, it's also the, the FRA uh, law framework is a very important because it actually recognized, legally recognized the GPS map and the satellite image as a one legal evidence to recognize the land claims. So what, is the, what are the larger learnings? So the larger learnings is to understand the larger space and scope of democratization of the technological innovations. So we adopted what we call an area saturation approach to cover the entire district. And why the entire district is important? Because we decided to produce a politically significant data. As I presented in my previous slide, there was a political lack of political will and there is a there is an inertia, there's a bureaucratic inertia. And if you really want to challenge all those things, you need a politically significant data for entire one district, not as a sample for few villages. We decided to go with the map of the entire life cycle of the land tenure. And for that, we have trained 60 young people. We decided to use a user-friendly technology and to a calibrated approach to refiling the claims and the appeals. And this actually helps us to reach out to the 58% cases which was rejected and the 42% of the cases which was pending over the last few years. So we have an aim to go with all these 37,000 cases in the next few months, and we hope and we'll be able to resolve all these cases in the favor of the people. And this is not just an individual land, but it's also talk about the communitarian land. So in my final note, I would say that if the time series imagery carried out in an independent, regulated, participatory, and transparent manner, the technology keeping its limitation in mind can go a long way, making the claims and appeal process more reliable and outcome oriented. For us, it's a logical way and linkages the people with the possibilities. Uh, it's important that data collection by using the technological innovation and the refiling claim, we have taken this as a mission approach by using the technology uh, as a source for the land rights, which actually is a key for the human rights. So if you really want to protect the human rights, if you really want to protect the land rights, this is the one way uh, how to go, how to use the technology to secure the people's customary land tenure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ramesh. A really inspiring and very concrete um, example of how technology is being used to expedite implementation of a policy that's existed for some time. Um, I want to ask you to hold questions for Ramesh and all questions for a question and answer period that we'll have after, um, including those online. If you can leave those in the chat, we're going to be collecting them and we'll have a moment um, to ask the panelists. And we're going to go now to Tanya, our next panelist, Tanya Ulalia Martinez Cruz, who is an Ayuk indigenous woman from Tamazulapa eh, del Espiritu Santo in Miche, Oaxaca, in Mexico. Tanya has a background as an irrigation engineer and a master's in agricultural and biosystems engineering from the University of Arizona. In 2009, she became the first indigenous recipient of a Fulbright scholarship in Mexico to pursue her graduate studies in the US. And today she will be speaking about her work as part of the organization Land is Life, speaking about how technology is being used by communities in Mexico as part of their internal governance and planning processes. Tanya, over to you. <clears throat> No, no, I think it's on. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I like telling stories because I think stories are powerful. And I just want to share that when I was born, my umbilical cord was buried in the backyard of my house because my grandmom, who was a shaman, told me that that's the place where I belong. And when I die, that's where I have to go back to close my cycle in life. That's also to tell you why land is so important, why forest and how we are interconnected with everything. Um, so we are discussing now why indigenous peoples are important, but also forests, because they cannot be forests if we don't also focus on people. Um, the facilitator was mentioning how 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is in indigenous territories. And I always ask people, how is that possible when we are just representing 6% of the 
whole world population, and yet there are continuous threats to indigenous peoples. I was reading the a news a couple of days ago, and I learned that in 2023, at least 70 indigenous land defenders were mur murdered on the name of development. So we cannot talk about forests if we don't talk in technology, if we don't talk about life, and we put rights at the center. Yeah, I think I, I was supposed to have a slide running and I didn't do, sorry. <laughs> My apologies on that. Um, so what we do at Land is Life is that we work on capacity development. We are a coalition of several indigenous organizations. Uh, we support capacity development, uh, training, so these indigenous peoples can defend themselves enact a right to self-determination. Just to give you some examples, in 2019, we gave 95 grants directly to indigenous peoples. Some of the things that we're doing now that we're talking about innovation and technology is mappings through GPS or other tools. For example, to help in the developing of some voluntary guidelines for indigenous peoples that are voluntarily isolated, they, they, they matter. And if they want to be isolated, they right to be isolated, they should be respected. That's something that we are supporting in the Amazonas, also in West Papua. Uh, we have helped in the recognition of indigenous people's lands, mapping uh, the, the titles and also trying to help them to get their legal rights. Um, we also are, I was mentioning about um, different land defenders that get murdered every year when they are defending their forests. So it's important for us also to help in mapping the different actors that are intervening in our territories, in our forests, so we can have actions to protect ourselves. I'm going to take you more to a practical example in my community. Um, for the first time in history, I, I, we mentioned that I'm from Oaxaca. We got land title, a land title, the right to have a land title in my community. So this is an interesting moment because now a lot of the things that we preserve are collective. We are mapping everything that is within our forest. This includes sacred places, um, our native seeds, the rivers, we are also monitoring the quality of rivers and we are based on a right to self-governance and self-determination, uh, indicating through these guidelines how we wanna look after the collective. Something that we also are trying to do, so this is just some of the participatory workshops. I always um, have issues when I have to come and deliver messages here because we are given five minutes sometimes to deliver when negotiations happens. I'm gonna tell you that we are developing this guideline and it's gonna take us at least a year because we're going village by village talking to everyone and the meetings are taking at least 10 hours, I can tell you, because everyone wants to have a saying, an opinion or why, how we should punish or uh, take care of the forest, uh, the quality of water, etc. This is participation and this is all the processes that we care about at Atlantis Life. It has to be a process that is driven by people. Um, what we are also doing is, um, this is an old picture of my community like 60, 70 years ago, because we are inevitably part of a globalized world. Land use is changing. And something that we are also predicting is reflecting collectively. Our territories have changed, our forests have changed. But it's also time to act now that we still have the privilege, I called it a privilege when it's a right to have a, the land title of, my, of the lands of my community. We can ensure what we are gonna offer to the future generations, to the children that might be living there and might become the custodians of tomorrow of the forest and biodiversity. So um, self-determination, it's so important, the rights to land, it's so important because in the face of extreme events, that is what makes us resilient. Just giving you an example in this community, it's a community where I did my PhD 
and they enacting their right to self-determination if they can have food, if they can control their territories, even with COVID, if they could control who was coming or not to the community, they could ensure no vectors would come and infect the whole population. That also reflects the collectiveness of values uh, that we uh, also involve in how we manage not only the forest, but the communal life in, in these communities. So, um, this is what I wanted to share with you, that if we want to build a um, resilient future, if we want to preserve our, our, our forest, if we want to continue protecting the biodiversity, we need to provide tools directly to indigenous peoples. We need to provide training, capacity building, be more these facilitators, especially in organizations where we sit and we have the possibilities of doing so. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya, for sharing and, and an example of how rights being awarded isn't the, the, the end of the road, right? That technologies, mapping technologies can really be a tool to, to further ensure that self-determination is, is taking place. So we'll now turn to our next panelist, um, Maria Paula Rizzo. Um, a lawyer, a software developer, and a GIS expert that has worked for the last 15 years with F FAO as a land tenure officer and a geospatial and informational specialist across the Indigenous Peoples Unit and the land tenure team. Her work is focused on land and natural resource tenure, um, the, the implementation of land information systems and participatory field data collection tools and methodologies, which is some of what she's going to talk to us about today. Um, today, she'll also be speaking to her work with the Open Tenure Tool, an open source mobile application that's used to document the land and territories used and held by indigenous peoples and provide evidence and official claims. Maria Paula, to you. Oh, thank you. How many, how many things? So yeah, thank you. Good afternoon to everybody, and I'm very honored uh, to be in this session together with these friends, also the, that colleagues. And uh, I feel a little bit uh, ashamed to talk after such such experiences, and I really hope to be able to. Uh, to give some inputs to the to the discussion. So technology can empower peoples through mapping and securing customary land can or, or might not. So this is something that we have to keep in our minds. So um, I will not speak about what FAO does because I think that this is pretty clear, uh, but what does a land tenure team, uh, a land tenure work does uh, in the context of FAO? Uh, this is pretty interesting. Uh, we have been discussing about um, ecosystem restoration, about forest, deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I have to say that also hearing very often uh, during several fora where indigenous people uh, have been involved, without tenure security, there is no sustainability for ecosystem restoration or for maintaining uh, forest. This is very important to, to understand. And I have been very glad to hear all the intervention also talking about the centrality of people. We have heard from, from Tanya the experience uh, from her community. And, and Tanya, I mean, she is such an expert. She is an engineer. She is an indigenous people leader. And um, <clears throat> and so, what I like to share with you is the how within the land tenure uh, team in FAO, but also within the indigenous people unit, how we are trying to put people at the center. Uh, indigenous people unit is advocating for indigenous people has several pillars uh, of work, one being biocentric restoration, 
uh, really putting the indigenous people of, at the center of the of the international and global dialogues and uh, within the land tenure team um, within FAO uh, after the, the endorsement of the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure of land fisheries for, forestry and fisheries we understood that there was the the need to to develop something and to give something uh, to people in order to support the recognition of all of those legitimate tenure rights that the voluntary guidelines has called and recommended to recognize and to protect, including those of indigenous people. So indigenous people have been recognized globally nowadays as key um, right, also, right holders, key custodians of forest. We have heard from, from Eva and also from uh, Ramesh and also from Tanya that indigenous people who has per the ILO uh, 2020 report were about more than 400 million over the world representing 6% of the, of the global population. They are maintaining 11% uh, of the global forests, which uh, correspond to 80% of the ecosystem. So still, or yet maybe, uh, indigenous people have not recognized their rights over their territories. And it's very important to understand that, um, how can I say, I was in a project in Guatemala and uh, uh, some indigenous people community were displaced from their territories and they were compensated with other territories. As for area size, it was, it was fair. The area size was the same, but it was not the same for the indigenous people because as Tanya said, th there is a different relation of indigenous people with land. So, why I'm saying this in the context of a technology innovation session is because uh, technology can help or might not help uh, because it might provide some ways that, that do not correspond to the real relation of the people with the, with the land. Uh, so it's important to provide tools, as Tanya was saying, that that provides tools for the indigenous people to become owner of those tools. And central in this is the free prior and informed consent. Uh, whatever uh, we will do with technologies cannot be done without this free prior and informed consent, which means also time. Uh, I am concerned that with technologies and with innovation, we are an uh, what can I say, a rushing approach, you know, because with innovation and with technology, we can do things very, very fast. And uh, there is the need for time to, to be able to, uh, to have participatory process, which is not uh, the, the final goal, the participation is the starting point. So with, with FAO, we have developed uh, a tool which is called Open Tenure. Uh, which is a geospatial information tool uh, with two components. One is a mobile application that can be used with the indigenous people communities and by the indigenous people communities on the ground to do um, uh, to collect information about the people, about also with the special definition of the land. And it consists, uh, it integrates a geospatial component with G GPS coordinates as well as Google map uh, satellite imageries that are freely available and I'm very glad of the memorandum of understanding between FAO and Google Earth because this means that uh, we are we are downloading locally the satellite imageries but we cannot keep them uh, for too long but still um, we are using this approach where we go to the field even the, if there is not internet connectivity to use GPS together with the satellite imageries downloaded with the community 
to, to collect information and to demarcate the land together with the community, uh, of course, after a process which is in integrating the free prior and informed consent. And um, how this is used in the forest context to map the state forest, community forest, but also the human settlements, because we have heard many countries to have the title to be enabled to stay on the land you have to document that you are there from uh, more than five years, ten years, it depends on the countries. Uh, the, the tool that we have developed is uh, configurable and customizable depending on the specific needs of the country and of the community. And so uh, this gives the ability to, to have a tool that fit for the purpose. And then there is another component, which is a server, where you do uh, upload all the information and you can have a validation process, which means that you can have the, the objections, you can uh, validate together with the community the data that has been uh, uploaded, so as to have a complete cycle, as Ramesh was also uh, indicating uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his presentation. Now, going to the to the end how indigenous people have used the, the the tool has been to increase the the local understanding of tenure rights which has also provided an intergenerational understanding so putting together the elders with the young youngest from the communities thus creating a shared knowledge uh, and a better understanding including the women uh, to empower the traditional authorities and communities so as to document their rights over the land and for internal self-government of the communities as well as to lay the foundation for an eventual formal uh, land registration. Um, that said, I think uh, it's open to any, any question at the end of the, of the panel and I give back the word. Thank, Thank you, you, Maria Paula. And we'll circle back to the question of, of challenges and barriers and how this technology isn't always applicable everywhere. Um, again, if those of you online can go ahead and leave your questions, we'll come back to that. But we have one more panelist. Um, so I'll introduce Jessica Webb, who I cannot see, but who must be down there, um, who's the strategy lead for forest and nature for people at the World Resources Institute. So Jessica leads efforts to enable locally led protection of forests and community forest rights across the tropics, supporting stakeholders to harness data for monitoring and management with a focus on the human dimensions of forest change. Today she'll be speaking to us about the Forest Watcher app and the Global Forest Watch, um, in addition to Landmark and the impact they've achieved. So Jessica, over to you. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, thanks to my fellow panelists, Ramesh, Tanya, Maria Paula, honored to be with you. And uh, thanks to you all for sharing this International Day of Forests with us. Um, so at uh, the World Resources Institute, um, our, at the heart of our mission is really about democratizing data uh, and ensuring that we remove as many barriers as possible to get a lot of the data innovations that we've heard about today um, to people who the la are the last mile users, um, but are often on the front lines of deforestation. Um, so with input from and collaboration with uh, indigenous peoples, uh, we've developed a number of um, open source uh, tools and data for uh, information to be able to um, manage, uh, monitor, and um, govern uh, customary lands in tropical forest countries. Okay. So um, many of you are probably familiar with the Global Forest Watch platform, um, but for those who aren't, uh, it's an, a free open source um, web-based platform that provides um, the ability to analyze both historical trends in terms of uh, deforestation uh, and uh, tree cover gain, as well as um, the related impacts on biodiversity and climate, and also uh, surfaces um, near real-time alerts, along with satellite imagery and contextual layers such as indigenous and community lands, concession areas, um, to provide information anywhere in the world on how and where uh, forests are changing. 
but of course in uh, many in, uh, indigenous communities and forested areas, uh, internet connectivity is uh, a barrier. Um, so with input from indigenous communities and um, other users on the ground, we developed a mobile application called Forest Watcher that allows users to download uh, the near real time deforestation and fire alerts, uh, navigate to these locations in the field, and document evidence through geotagged photos and um, customizable surveys um, to record observations of what is found. Um, uh, as Ava mentioned, um, WRI also um, has co-developed the landmark uh, platform, which is a, a global web map featuring geo-referenced uh, uh, information on um, customary lands around the world um, to, to support indigenous communities in uh, protecting land rights and securing land tenure. And Landmark is governed by a coalition of indigenous organizations and supported by um, a handful of international organizations, um, uh, which WRI and ILC are the technical secretariat. So our role in this is, is um, working with the coalition to, to develop the platform and deliver the data. Um, so both platforms share a lot of data between them. Um, this is examples from Global Forest Watch, but you can see the brown polygons, which are indigenous uh, land maps. These are in Peru um, that come from Landmark and the near real time um, alerts so that uh, communities can see um, both where encroachment is happening on their lands in order to be able to uh, rapidly respond to that, uh, also communicate and advocate for um, uh, climate finance, increased protections, et cetera. Um, but in order to ground this in a couple of examples, um, I wanted to, to um, first zoom into uh, an experience from northern Peru, uh, where we partnered with Rainforest Foundation US and an indigenous federation, Orbio, um, to develop a, a, a system to get from, um, from deforestation alert to impact. Um, because really the, the technological uh, innovation is happens at the level of the user. The technology uh, itself is a, is a useful tool, um, but uh, just putting technology out there is not enough. Um, it needs to be paired with traditional knowledge, with experience from the local context, um, and, uh, and uh, with uh, custom strategies in order to, to really um, get from, you know, kind of the, the uh, data to impact and that's really where the innovation happens um, so the, in this example um, we could develop a strategy um, where uh, indigenous um, uh, specialists receive the deforestation alerts um, curate and analyze these and then distribute them to indigenous community <clears throat> monitors who are um, investigating um, the uh, locations of the uh, alerts uh, identifying illegalities or determining um, you know, whether or not uh, the deforestation that's occurring is authorized or not. Um, this then is brought to uh, community assemblies um, where communities discuss and decide um, if the uh, information collected was indeed due to um, illegal deforestation, unauthorized deforestation, but that could be handled um, through uh, internal um, governance processes or dialogue or if the information should be submitted to authorities. And um, this is, these are some photographs of some results of these field of investigations. Um, and um, in an independent randomized control trial, actually that um, Rebecca from Google mentioned in her presentation this morning, um, we found that um, in the um, roughly half of 80 communities that were involved in the study, um, who were uh, applying these um, technologies and strategies from alert to impact uh, achieved a 52% reduction in deforestation in the first year, an additional 21% in the second year of the study. Um, but perhaps even more importantly, through household surveys, um, the communities uh, in, involved in the, the monitoring protocols reported a higher satisfaction with forest governance within their communities. Um, and in another example from uh, this time with the landmark platform, um, zooming halfway around the world to the Philippines, um, the Ikahalan people uh, have been um, stewarding forests, um, uh, managing forests, uh, ancestral lands for 
um, generations. Um, but some of these lands were threatened by a potential uh, mining project. And so um, the Philippines Association for um, Development in Intercultural, uh, Philippines Association for International Intercultural Development, sorry about that, um, worked, uh, who was part of the steering group, um, used the uh, forest carbon analysis function on landmark um, to determine that uh, the lands in the Ikalan people's communities uh, held the equivalent of nearly 3 million tons of carbon, which is um, equivalent to uh, yearly emissions from 2.3 million vehicles. Um, they were able to use this information successfully to lobby uh, in uh, congressional action um, to compare the potential carbon sequestration rates of these lands um, with projected mining revenues and concluded on this cost benefit analysis um, that it made more sense to um, cons continue to conserve these, these territories. And um, uh, the uh, lands were officially declared a no-go zone for mining. Um, also uh, using uh, PAFID and, um, and, uh, and the Ikalan communities used uh, this information to successfully advocate for official recognition of the land as a indigenous and community conserved area, so an ICCA area. Um, so I will uh, end it there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Another powerful example of how technology is being used to deploy rapid alerts with um, yeah, measurable impact. So time is short, um, and I want to, to pivot quickly to the audience to see if you have any burning questions for the panelists. We're also going to be taking some questions online, but for those of you here, put a hand up if you, if you have something in your mind. Um, otherwise, um, we'll go to, yes. Yes, to you, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thanks to the panelists and thanks to FAO for including this panel in the official commemoration of the International Day of Forests. Sorry for my voice. Um, I think what this panel has brought about and which was somewhat missing in the beginning is that forest protection time and again comes along with serious human rights violations and i think if we want to make if we want to use the power of the tools that have been presented this morning i think these tools need to be these remote sensing tools need to be accompanied with this type of bottom up data that has been presented here to ensure that further forest protection actually improves the livelihoods of those who are living in situations of vulnerability. And thank you very much, dear panelists, for making this point. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Does anyone want to respond to that? Please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Jess, for your interesting remarks. So, I mean, uh, what we learned through our own uh, journey of uh, understanding the Forest Rights Act and the potential of the technology to use for reclaiming or refiling uh, the appeals and to get land back, uh, linking the people with the possibilities, uh, I would say. So here for us, the capacity to know the law, capacity to know the technology, it's, it's one step. It's just a prerequisite. But the next step is, is, to, is to understanding the whole, those, those potential to refile the claim, to reclaim the land, and to resolve the land entitlement. So that's that's the one key thing which actually we learned uh, with our experiences. And it's important, uh, especially in Indian context, because I mean, 25% of the indigenous world's indigenous population is actually lived in the Indian con continent. So it's a very, very important. There's a legal framework, there is a technology, there is a simple technology. And what Gandhi said, being a Gandhian organization, I would say that in a simple way, you can shake the world. So we are just trying to understand the simplicity of the technology to resolve the people's conflicts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Reinforcing the importance of this kind of data work on the ground. Um, are there other questions from the audience? Things you'd like to ask about the tools presented here? We do have a question online, which I will 
go to um, from Yusuf. And this is a question about access um, and, and the accessibility of some of these tools. So what can we do when it's difficult for the technology to be explained. Um, so when technology is not accessible, and many of you have given examples of working with communities that might not have worked previously with these tools or technologies, right? What do we do in those cases? In this regard, capacity development is fundamental. So if you want to empower and really have tools that are enabling uh, communities uh, that are enabling people uh, to protect their rights, you have to also include the sound capacity development so that the communities become, uh, as I said already, owner of that technology. Uh, which means that whoever is developing any kind of intervention or any kind of uh, project uh, to, uh, to the field has have to take into account, as I mentioned, the time, and in the time you have the FPIC and capacity development, so as for really implementing the FPIC. And uh, provide, I, I forgot to mention that, for instance, uh, Open Tenure is an open source tool, technology, and uh, you have also to provide all the material that can be uh, of support for them and develop also tools that are accessible. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, if others want to address those challenges in their own work, please. I agree with Maria Paola, but I also, <clears throat> I think youth can play an important role um, in, 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 they are innovators at the ages and they can also contribute a lot. What we do at Land is Live is when we talk about capacity development, it's also about exchange and experiences. Some of the things that we learn other people is using in their territories, we also think this is something that we could be using in our territories. So exchange, capacity development, the building of networks. Um, capacity development is also important because many times we are on the side of the experts that want to come and train and support communities, but we could also can change our assumptions on what is the best way that we think these tools can work by incorporating uh, the knowledge, the aspirations and the needs that they have that might be a bit different sometimes than the ones that we bring as experts. Jessica, I don't know if you want to, you, you're working you know, with an app, not only a, a tool. What does that learning curve look like in the work you do? Yeah. Um, again, we, we, you know, try to um, design uh, both the mobile applications and online platforms to d directly address user needs. We do extensive user testing and research um, in the field. Um, but of course, you know, there, there will always be, um, you know, some sort of limitations, um, you know, the, all of the, um, uh, the website as well as the application are translated into you know as many languages as, as we can we can manage um but but a lot of it really happens i think the again a lot of the access issues and um um particularly um working with indigenous youth they pick up the technology pretty quickly like it's 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 a matter of you know sitting down and spending the time we we tend to uh, deploy a train the trainers approach so finding a couple champions right within communities who are interested and motivated and really they do a much much better job than you know we could do um you know sitting in uh our offices in washington dc um to to be able to contextualize um the tool um in relation to the impact that is desired to be achieved like the you know examples i gave from peru and the philippines right like that's something that we can't do it takes a um, it's more important to have the, you know, strong expertise um, in those particular contexts in order to be able to achieve impact. But I would say that even um, in terms of access or um, challenges, it's not so much learning how to use the, the technologies and deploy them. I would say um, bigger barriers are really around uh, resources and recognition. Um, resources, we hear from a lot of uh, uh, communities that are doing monitoring, an excellent job documenting all of the um, encroachment and illegal activity and rights violations 
in their, um, that are happening on their lands, like they know what the problem is and the data and technologies are, are good enough to help with that. They have all the information, um, but they are lacking in resources, particularly um, uh, direct mobilization of financial resources to support these activities, which are costly. Um, and, you know, not only take up people's time, but also to be able to travel to these, you know, remote areas and, um, you know, put, uh, you know, gas in the boat and all of the, the supplies and equipment that, that are needed. Uh, and also the recognition um, of uh, all the evidence that's being collected by uh, communities oftentimes still needs to be backed up with an official like law enforcement operation. Um, so if community um, collected evidence was able to be recognized in legal processes without having to go through that second phase of investigation, um, that would go a long way um, into seeing more, more results of these monitoring activities. Thank you. And I'm going to squeeze in a final question back here, and then we'll come back and close. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, to the panelists, this has been a really important panel. Thank you for your perspective. So <clears throat> as a technologist, I like to believe that technology solves everything. But I've learned over the years, no, it's just a piece. And if you don't have the right political reality, it doesn't matter. The data will not be effective and lead to impact. So I imagine in the context of indigenous land tenure and rights, there are very different political realities around the world and the technology is just a piece um, and we've seen in certain countries that uh, political sort of um, polarization has been created around if indigenous people get more rights that's coming at the expense of non-indigenous people and economic development and so on so all right long-winded intro but I guess my question is and Ramesh you were starting to give an example of how you combat the challenge of the rejections by really knowing the law and by really documenting it in a way that's incontrovertible. I'm just wondering if there's a set of best practices maybe that would help different groups address the, all of these challenges. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, thanks for your very, very important question. I mean, Understanding the whole context of customary land tenure uh, 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 in India, uh, we are actually taking the challenge of 18th, 19th, and 20th of century. So the poor, the poor people who are landless by default because of the colonial legislation, they are the seventh, eighth, and ninth generation landless and homeless poor. So understanding that past, that the wrongs, and using the 21st era of technology, a very simple technology, like Kobo is not a very complicated thing. Uh, GPS uh, system is not a co complicated thing. Satellite images, no more a rocket science today. And encouraging the young people, what Maria and Tanya said, to understand this whole potential here, to understand the, the, the importance of those technology and to resolve the generational question of landless and homeless poor. I mean, on the one side, we talk about the SDG, no one left behind. But what about those people who have already left behind since generation? So understanding that potential is very, very important. And for us, this whole exercise, and thanks to uh, Jazz, thanks to TMG, thanks for Federal Minister of Economic Aid Corporation to giving us this big boost to understand that potential and to resolve those uh, cases. And I would say, uh, Julian, I will be happy to send you the data next year once we complete the whole cycle. And I'm very confident that we'll be able to resolve a few thousand cases on the ground and to secure customary land tenure to the indigenous people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think um, we, sh we should talk more about how we document these best practices, right? And I think we should take that discussion to the atrium because we're on just the top of the hour. I want to give the floor, however, back to Tanya, who's going to, given her storytelling powers, ground us again in the reality of these communities and remember that this technology is enabling, it's facilitating, it does not replace um, the, the traditional knowledge that these communities have and it can only enhance it. So back to you, Tanya. I had a, I think my, we might have to play my presentation again. If not, I can tell you so. Um, I mentioned how we are connected to the land and in my community, when you get 
conferring power or if we elect our authorities, we are given a wooden cane that is what we use to hold power for one year in the office. But that wooden cane is also symbolic to protect the community. To protect the community in that wooden cane, we have to wash it in a sacred spring. And my people says, if we don't preserve the springs, I think, um, if we don't preserve the springs, we won't have water to protect and have that shield that enables us to live. I always talk about territory and our communities as a bubble, because whatever that we enact and protect inside will give us life, but also we um, will give us life, but also we will look after the mother earth. Um, it's just this picture. I don't know where is that. <laughs> is i think well you see in the grandmothers smiling in my community ah no there was a was there was a last slide that one so this is the wooden cave that i'm telling you so if we're talking about protecting forests protecting water protecting life we have to put people at the center and this was the mes message that i wanted to convey to you if we want to look after the future let's secure also the rights for the future generations thank you thank you thanks to all the panelists oh, thanks to all of you thank you so much eva ramesh and the whole panel that was definitely my favorite panel so far